uh, after hearing Mark, you can see how you get very excited about it, Tucker. You know, so when I met him before I bought the car, I heard him talk and I said, man, I gotta have one of those cars. <laughs> He's a great representative of uh, the Tucker Automobile. So this is Tucker 1044. The one thing about the Tuckers, except for the Tin Goose, every Tucker is known by the chassis number. So if mean, you talk to a Tucker owner, that's the thing they go, which one do you want? 1032, 1044. So I'm, I'm the proud owner of 1044. The original uh, plate is that uh, you'll see on, on the trunk when uh, we open up the hood. Uh, and this is one of the cars that Mark talked about that was not, when the factory closed, uh, it wasn't completed, so eight of the uh, Tuckers were actually completed after the factory closed. Loyal employees came back and finished the car, and including Alex Kremitz, the designer. So when you look at 1044, this is one of the few cars in the world that actually was finished by the person who helped design the car. Uh, the original engine on these cars, the, the Tucker engines, you're, you're going to find out more about them, these helicopter engines. They were meant to be swapped out when they broke down. And somewhere along the history of this car in the 70s, uh, the original Tucker engine in this car was swapped out with another Tucker engine that uh, I believe Les Schaefer brought as a spare. Uh, the color of this car is, is rather unique. Uh, there were eight uh, Tuckers made in Dante Green. And what you're looking at is what we believe is the original Andante green too. We, we, we've seen a couple other truckers and they're all different types of greens. We got this color off the wheel well. There was some of the green paint was inside the wheel well. We did a computer analysis and what you're looking at is what a real trucker and Dante green looks like too. And we also have a, a green broad, broad cloth. You'll hear about the restoration. We, we searched all over to get back to the original uh, cloth of that we found that I believe it was in Germany. There were seven Tuckers with this green interior. This car was sold at auction for $2,000 at the Tucker auction on October uh, 18, 1948. Uh, and this was purchased with uh, the Tin Goose. Uh, so this was the original owner of the Tin Goose also owned 1044. So the Tucker itself, uh, you'll see I have a little handout back there little, that gives the, uh, the total ownership. It passed through five additional owners from 51 to 2016, and it had all different colors. Uh, we documented that in 1951, it was actually maroon. So they took the green, they made it maroon, and they showed it at different uh, car conventions. And then um, it was converted in the 1970s to root beer, which is kind of, a kind of a root beer. And, uh, it stayed that way for about 30 years or so. And it was uh, not an obviously root beer is not an original Tucker color, but it did make it very distinctive, the, the car. You, you knew when 1044 was being displayed uh, because uh, it was so distinctive. Interesting enough, though, it didn't get displayed that much. Uh, skip, oh wait, uh, the one other thing, it did get uh, shown in 1981. For those people who've gone to AACA, it was the, the car of the year in 1981. Those wind cross trucks, they, they had the Tucker uh, car was on the, on the truck, and it was highlighted. And here you see uh, Les Schaefer winning, putting on a plaque that he got the national first prize at the AACA. And he, he was so excited, he, he bolted it right to the center of the Tucker. Something that you normally would not do today, I don't believe. But we're very, by bolting it on there, it survived, and here it is today. And we're going to put this in the front of the car. We're going to mount this along with uh, the other, I think we have a Pebble Beach plaque on there. We're going to put the AACA plaque, the original plaque, back on there as well. Eventually this was sold to Skip Grow, who had the car for about 30 years, and he, he loved the car, but he never drove it. He kept it in a barn. I think he had a total of 15 miles on it for 30, over 30 years. And, and it was kind of like the lost Tucker. Everybody heard about it. Nobody ever saw it again. It's that brown Tucker that's somewhere, you know, in Ohio. In Ohio. Well, Mark Lieberman, would, <laughs> you, you put a challenge out to Mark. He was 
was going to buy that car, and eventually, if it was an opportunity, he was going to buy that car. And he did eventually buy that. Uh, and uh, I, I talked to Mark many times about the excitement about it. And we see the photo over here on the, on the right. You can see it coming out of the barn after 30 years. And I, I believe John helped as well take that car out there. So we have it very well documented when the car finally came out of the Ohio barn. And, uh, you know, there we go. So I purchased this car in 2017 in the uh, RM auction in Scottsdale. And this is where I uh, first met up with the Ida's and Sean Tucker. Because I, before I buy a car, uh, first of all, the car has to have certain requirements. It has to have that wow factor. I, 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 I go for historic cars that I can really dig into with the research and do a lot of history on it. Uh, you know, as Fred said, I, I, I have uh, a Vanderbilt Cup race car, the Alto Black Beast, and I really got into uh, documenting the Vanderbilt Cup races on my website. And I love digging into a car, learning the history, and sharing it with people. Sharing the history of the car, sharing um, where it raced and, uh, and how it affected people. I've been involved with many of the Vanderbilt Cup race families itself. So I've been doing that. I, I ended up with Walter Chrysler's car. I have a Mustang, uh, 1963 pre-production Mustang, uh, the Mustang 3. Uh, which is a, a, a wild car, it was the ninth Mustang ever built, the first eight are unknown and destroyed. So uh, when it came to a Tucker, uh, I was always excited. I, I had, like some other people here, we went up to Hershey, we saw the cabinet collection there, and I looked at the Tucker and said, that's a car that fits perfectly with what I like to do in my collection. And I uh, always wanted to have a Tucker, and then in, in the RM uh, watching came in 2017, I did my due diligence. I asked people uh, to try to find out about the car itself. I spoke to Mark Lieberman, and then I also spoke to Bob Ida, that's uh, Rob's father, who uh, was involved in doing these mining day coach built Tuckers. And the first thing he told me, he said, well, you got to talk to Sean and Mike Tucker about the car. They know that. So I had him, again, before I bought the car, I, I talked to Sean and had an extensive conversation. He, he loved the car. So when I went out to Scottsdale, he was very excited about it. And, uh, uh, and then after talking to Mark, I was really sold on the car. And I ended up being fortunate enough to purchase the car itself. So uh, we brought the car back. It was unrestored. And we showed it around. Uh, uh, and it was a very drivable car. It was in good shape. Um, and then the came question, what do we do with it? Do we restore it? Uh, to bring it back. I knew I wanted to change the color. I wanted to change the color back to, to the original green. And uh, then I, after talking to Rob, uh, they came out to my garage and I decided uh, that this would be the great combination of having Rob Ida and uh, the Tucker family restore this car. And the, the first thing they said, as I said, uh, I told you, I asked them how long would it take? And they looked at the car and said, it's in good shape, the metal's good. It took to take about three years. And I go, three years, I really don't want to have a car that would be without that car for three years. And I said, well, let's do it in phases. And he said, let's, uh, let's go for uh, the, uh, the winter and, the, and part of the spring and see how far you can get it done. Then we got accepted at Double Beach. And he said, well, we got Double Beach is eight months away. Let's see how much you can do in eight months. They did the whole restoration, the three year restoration in eight months. But uh, the hours were still there and they did it in eight months. So I'm going to let them tell that story of how they restored Tucker 1044 and how they managed to do three years of restoration in eight months. Okay, Mike? All right, so I'm, I'm Mike with the short beard. Uh, that's John. Uh, All right, so first I want to thank Howard uh, for letting us be part of this restoration. Uh, never in a million years did we ever think we were going to uh, be this close to, to one of the original cars and then let alone be able to spend this much time with it, get this far into the 
car itself, and you know, be working on the same metal that my grandfather was that many years ago. So thanks, Howard, for uh, letting us be a part of it and continuing to let us be a part of it. So as Howard mentioned, when we first got together to talk about this car, we were fairly adamant that we wanted to make it as original as possible. We wanted to make sure that, that if we did do some work to the car, that it, it took it back to the way that this car left the factory back in 1948. So instead of calling it a restoration project, we call it a preservation project. Luckily for us, although this car had been restored a couple times in the past, uh, those, two, those two owners had kept it very original, which was surprising. A lot of the parts that uh, were original to this car, from suspension to um, you know, a lot of the things you don't see, they used it. This car didn't have a whole lot of miles on it, so they left it, and luckily for us, it was still there. Uh, as Howard mentioned, we did not keep the brown paint or the brown interior, because that was a little bit rough. But uh, you know, other than that, we wanted to make sure, one, we took it back, two, we didn't over-restore it, and that, uh, you know, that, that's a challenge, because there were only 40, 47 of these cars left, 51 originally built. So the first thing we had to figure out was, how do we figure out what's original? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and some of the documentation that we used ahead of time. So luckily for us, uh, there's a museum down at Hershey, the AAC Museum, we've talked about it several times. The gentleman that donated his collection to that museum was named David Kamek, and he was just about the, the biggest Tucker fanatic that you will ever meet. He collected everything Tucker. He had three cars, he had the test chassis, uh, the original 13 test engines, um, and, and the best thing for us, he had nearly every, every blueprint print that existed for this car. Um, the bad news was they were all in banker's boxes, not in order, so uh, lots of hours in the basement between me and Sean, me and Sean trying to figure out what's what when we needed something. But that was one of the huge assets that we had during this restoration. One of the other things that we used, um, we know a lot, of, a lot of the parts on the car were produced by other companies. So Mark had mentioned that Motorola made the radios. Um, so you have a couple other examples up here. Several Autolite parts. Um, Franklin produced the engine. So Sean and I, at the very beginning of the restoration, had to go search on eBay for repair manuals for all of those things so that we could make sure we knew, one, how to fix them, how to maintain them, things like that. So you'll see that documentation up there. Um, along with several other things that were produced by the Tucker Club. Uh, so you can see David, Dave actually kept really crazy notes of everything he did to his three cars. Whenever he fixed anything or whenever he rebuilt anything, he would make little notes. So you'll see in the middle there, uh, like the, the, that chicken scratch note, and he kept it all in notebooks, all in order. So uh, I think that one's about the lighter. But uh, he, he was very meticulous about doing that, which helped us a lot as we were going through the restoration. One of the other things that you'll see with Tucker's, uh, because there's only 47 cars, you, you can reference those cars. Um, if you look at how they changed the car throughout the run of the cars, uh, individual cars or runs of cars tend to have the same parts. So one of the things we had to pay close attention to was Tucker number 40, 41, 46, 45, um, to make sure that any parts we found unique to 44 that we didn't think were right or didn't match a blueprint, uh, we, we checked with those cars to see if they had them because they did change a lot of things throughout the run of cars because they're all prototypes. There were only 50. Um, one of the very unique cars, other than, the, than those cars that are in close proximity to 44, is Tucker number 1016. So, Tucker number 1016 lives in the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. You can see a picture of it there. Uh, it is the only remaining Tucker that is essentially original. They have done some paint and chrome work to the car, but it has an original interior, an original engine compartment, um, an original front compartment. We took many, many trips to Michigan to study this car to make sure anything that was original we used. So, uh, when working with the, uh, the gentleman in the interior that we'll talk about in a minute, we were like literally in there looking at threads and you know, where the seams of the carpet were and measuring the door panel uh, spacing and things like that. So, spent a lot of time with that car. Uh, we also had a lot of access to original photos of cars uh, before they were restored. And one of the ones that uh, we used the most was Tucker number 1039. I could probably do a whole talk about the story around that car. Um, but uh, it ended up in the Smithsonian Museum. Years later, we met the gentleman that restored that car. He gave us about 500 photos of it when he found it originally. So uh, there's a couple of them there in the bottom right-hand corner that you see. We used that again for referencing <coughs> what was right, what was not right, um, and things like that. <coughs> uh, 
All right, so I'm going to go through just a couple of part examples of some of the things that we did. You'll see on the left side here, this is one of the shocks from Chapter 1044. Uh, this shock was actually on the car when we took it apart, and uh, as soon as Rob took it off, he asked us to take a look at where, where can we get this shock to wear items you would think they were used somewhere else. Um, so, Sean and I immediately started looking for, well, where can we find this shock? Um, Sean, Sean actually called Gabriel, because on the shock, I don't know if you can see it there, but it says Gabriel, and gave him the number that was on the shock, and they came back and said, that shock doesn't exist. And we said, well, well, it does, because we have one. And well, the only way it could exist is, you know, it must have been on a small run of some experimental car. Like, well, we have that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, lo and behold, we have the original, uh, it's, it's called a BB series shock from Gabriel. Uh, after that, as we were digging through the blueprints, we actually found the original blueprints for that shock. So you'll see uh, the rear is on the left and the front is on the right. And it knows the exact same Gabriel BB series shock. So we are certain that those are original. Uh, those were restored uh, along with hardware and put back on 1044. Um, another situation with parts, if you look at the headlights, so headlights that came out of Tucker 1044 were replaced because headlights burn out, and over uh, 50 years or so that happens. So instead of starting with the actual part on that, we started with the blueprint. Um, if you look up on the, the top right side there, the lucky thing with Dave's collection, not only did he have every Tucker print that existed, he had every single supplier blueprint blueprint for every part that was on this car. So uh, if you zoom in on that print, you can see all the way down to like the writing on the lens on the bottom, exactly what that lens looked like, which light it was, uh, which was very good for us to figure out and very difficult to find. So uh, we found a couple of NOS examples of these lights. One we shipped over from Europe, uh, one that we ultimately found in Canada. So those are the, the only two Westinghouse original 6 volt 4030 Tucker lights that we know of that exist. So they are, uh, hopefully they never burn out. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, and lastly I'm going to talk a little bit about the interior. So the interior challenge was a little bit different. Um, spacing and things I talked about before were a challenge, but also figuring out what colors existed. If you looked at a lot of the blueprints for the interior, they set a color in text, but they didn't give you a what that color actually was. There were no pictures or anything like that of the car. So um, we got very, very lucky with a couple of different things. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the awesome brown interior up there in the top photo. Uh, when we pulled that off with the sun visors, the original green broadcloth was still underneath those sun visors. So we had those samples. And if you look at the, uh, that, that's the rope that came off the back of the back seat. I'm sorry, the back of the front seat, right there, uh, which looks like, it looks like it's brown. It's actually very faded green. So if you take that off, flip it over, that green is still on the back. So both of those we either found or remade and used that on 44. Strangely enough, my father also has a pretty sizable collection of Tucker things that he's gathered over the years. And about 20 years ago, somebody sent him a sample of a rest, uh, an original interior from the restoration they had done. He sent it to us. I pulled it out of the envelope, and oh, lo and behold, it's a green card. So I took the broadcloth from that interior, compared it to the samples, it was exactly the same. So we are certain that this is exactly what that green interior should have looked like, down to the colors, the spacing, everything. Um, one of the other things that we use the blueprints for, as far as colors are concerned, we, we created a little key with the interior to figure out what colors, what things were color-coded with the Tucker interiors and what were not. So Tucker had three interiors. There was a beige, a blue, and a green. So as we looked at the blueprints, if it referenced three different uh, other blueprints, you knew that that component was color-coded. If it didn't, you know that wasn't. So things like the carpet, the vinyl on the dash had one blueprint, so we knew we could go back to Tucker 1016 to get the colors for that. If it had three, we had to use samples that we had. So this, this example of the armrest here, you'll see the call out, you probably can't read it, but it references um, six different prints, two sets of three, telling us that those armrests were color-coded to the original interior. So that, that was kind of the thing we used throughout the interior. So next, uh, Sean's going to talk a little bit about parts that we couldn't find and some of the work that he did to create those parts uh, today. Hello, everyone. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what, what do we do when we run into the situation where the 
parts on, on Tundra 44 were not there. So, as Mike mentioned and, and, and Howard and some of the others, Tundra 44 was, was remarkably intact. It had been painted a few times, but uh, when we started pulling the parts off and, and started looking uh, at, at what was still there, there was a lot that, that was original, but we inevitably hit, uh, hit the point where we, we had to make or replace you know, some, some parts of, of what was there. So, what, what do you do in that case? can't just, you know, roll down here, close this Tucker dealership and go pick up some parts. So, uh, I'm an engineer by training and, and, and working with Rob Ida, we're able to uh, leverage some new technology and some old technology and, and be able to recreate the parts in a way, sometimes when they're originally made and sometimes using some newer technology so that we can create the things that we're not, not uh, still there. So I'm going to talk about just a few examples of that. So the first one, is uh, relative to the hardware on the car. And uh, that's, that's one thing that, that when Mike and I are looking at an original Tucker, we, we pay pretty close attention to, because you can get an idea of, even if the car's been painted or, or taken apart or restored, uh, how, much, how much care was taken in either replacing it or if it wasn't touched. So Tuckers have pretty distinctive uh, pieces of hardware, the way the heads are marked and things like that. We've studied them enough that, that we know kind of what goes where. So maintaining that was, was really important. So we literally took apart every fastener on this car, restored and refretted every single one, and then replated them to the original finish. So selecting the correct finish, uh, we were able to reference the blueprints and find out that it was a, a cadmium plated finish, which is not exactly environmentally friendly. So uh, we, we substituted a different plating finish that looked Looks exactly like cadmium, but uh, was a little less hazardous and uh, would last a little longer. And believe it or not, I did all the plating of these fasteners in my basement. Um, my wife is here, and she can tell you how uh, much plating it smells bad and stains and makes noise. But uh, we were uh, we were able to do all of all of that stuff in uh, you know in, in, in learn how to do it. So that's that's kind of one of the other things is a lot of these things we, we just had to figure out and. and Really, anybody can do that kind of stuff. It's just a matter of, of doing it. And that's kind of a lot of what made Tucker 44 what it is, is, is there was a lot of, you know, we're just going to do it. So the other, uh, the other one that probably a lot of other car people that have worked on cars or restored cars would be familiar with is, is rubber. Rubber's a challenge, especially in a car that's this old. So it tends to degrade it's, uh, with, with UV and it dries out and things like that. So on a Tucker, Fortunately, there was a number of very specific pieces of rubber, one of them being the pop-out windshield feature. So, to get that to function correctly, you kind of need the right gasket. And then same thing on the, on the back window. The back window, when you, when you, when you look at 1044, uh, the garnish mold is actually formed by the rubber. So, trying to get those pieces in there correctly is the challenge. And sometimes you can find a piece of rubber that might fit, but in, in our case, we were far enough off that we said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna make tooling for these parts and make them the same way that they were originally. So we leveraged some modern CAD programs. I use a, a CAD program called SolidWorks, and we drew the new profiles, sent, uh, sent the rubber out to be tooled up, and we actually reproduced all that rubber, and, uh, and in, all within the eight months that we had. So it was, uh, it was a busy eight months. So the next one is, uh, is the glass marking. And this one I, I picked really because it's, it's a seemingly small detail, but uh, for us it was one of those kind of things that was important. So when we took up our Tucker 44, all, some of the original glass was still intact, and actually the back window in the car is, is the only uh, curved piece of glass that, that exists. It was in remarkably good shape, and, and we chose on that one to reuse it, so it was uh, not kind of delaminated like some of the other pieces. But, on, on the flat glass, we, we, we ended up having, it wasn't really usable safety-wise and you couldn't see through it because it had been delaminated, but what, what was important is that we made sure that it looked like the originals. So again, we went back to what kind of Mike talked about and uh, looked in the blueprints to find out who the original manufacturer was. I redrew all the original logos using a modern CAD software, and then uh, we manufactured some stencils in order to etch the glass. Um, Interestingly, the, the words on those stencils are teeny tiny. So the, the width of those letters is like 10 thousandths of an inch. So then how do you make that thing? Uh, I actually, uh, we, 
we, we cut it out of a CNC machine with an end mill that's 5,000 of an inch in diameter, so like two human hairs. So that little stencil there that looks super simple took about 48 hours to make. So it's uh, one of those little details that uh, you, you'll see the markings on, on the glass, but uh, it's not easy to get there. So this, uh, this is the last piece I'm going to talk about. This was probably one of the most challenging pieces on the car. Um, and, and Mark knows about this one too. <laughs> but these, uh, this is a gauge surround that goes around the speedometer that's uh, in, in front of the driver. And uh, pretty distinctive piece. It's got a barrel, very art deco -y kind of styling to it. But uh, they're, they're known for breaking. And, and the one in Tucker 44 was, was broken to the point where we couldn't really reuse it. So what, uh, what I did instead is I, I kind of glued it all back together and repaired it to the point where I could make a mold from the original. So uh, the one on the left on the bottom there is actually the original piece. It's got a bunch of filled things and body filler and things like that. But then it's all polished to the point where if you look on the top left, I can make a silicone mold from it. And that's what I did. From there, I uh, took a urethane rubber product, I'm sorry, urethane plastic product, and actually poured a new one. And trying to do this without getting any air bubbles in it and making sure that it's actually uh, a part that's aesthetically pleasing, this thing was really hard. <laughs> so I would not recommend trying this yourself, but it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was, when it finally worked, it was super rewarding. And it was at the very end where we were kind of getting you know, just getting ready for Pebble Beach, and I had just finished it up, so it's, uh, this one's, uh, this one's special for me. So, uh, now Rabbi is going to come up and talk a little bit about, uh, the body and some of the other